call it the greening of America. As the price of crude oil continues to fluctuate and concern about climate change spreads, Americans are increasingly interested in renewable energies. It's only with an informed and an active consumer class that we will actually, in the future, solve our energy issues. Investment in renewables continues to rise, and the Obama administration hopes to see 25% of the nation's electricity come from renewable sources by 2025. I think you have a very new spirit when it comes to energy and related environment issues in the Obama administration. But is alternative power realistic to fuel the energy-hungry U.S.? Next on Great Decisions. In a democracy, agreement is not essential, but participation is. Join us as we discuss today's most critical global issues. Join us for Great Decisions. Great Decisions is produced by the Foreign Policy Association, inspiring Americans to learn more about the world. Funding for Great Decisions is provided by the Carnegie Corporation of New York, the Star Foundation, Shell International, and the European Commission. Great Decisions is produced in association with the University of Delaware. And now, from our studio, here's Robert Nolan. Welcome to Great Decisions. I'm Robert Nolan. Joining us to discuss energy and U.S. foreign policy are Michael Levy, Senior Fellow for Energy and the Environment at the Council on Foreign Relations, and John Byrne, Distinguished Professor of Energy and Climate Policy here at the University of Delaware. Gentlemen, thanks for being with us on Great Decisions. Thank you. Thank you. So energy independence is something that previous presidents for decades have been talking about. But today it seems that the buzzword really is energy security. What's the difference between the two, Michael? Energy independence talks about a goal of only making energy in America to be used in America without having to import anything. Energy security is a much broader concept involving lining up the way we produce and consume energy with our overall security objectives. It's much broader. It recognizes that energy independence isn't possible, but that we can reconcile our energy policy and our security policy effectively. Uh, John, is there one of those areas that we should be focusing our attention on more than the other? Well, I think the energy security issue is the key for us uh, as a country. And, uh, but inside of that, we need to figure out uh, the strategies that we're going to use for that particular purpose. Are we going to focus on trying to uh, produce international policies that regulate market prices, or are we trying to look really at ways in which the U.S. can take better control locally with its own uh, energy needs? And I think uh, we need to do both, but uh, particularly we need to focus a bit on how we can uh, play a role in uh, designing our own energy future. Well, on that note, consumers have really been more active in recent years in terms of following U.S. energy policies. Uh, is this simply a fad? Are they concerned about the cost of energy? Uh, are they concerned about climate change? Uh, Michael? Whenever energy prices are high, in particular whenever gasoline prices are high, consumers pay attention and they pay attention to energy policy. Uh, climate change concerns have compounded that, but I think the leading piece still is a concern about price. Uh, there's also worries about where the money goes when we buy oil, in particular from abroad, whether it's going to Iran, whether it's going to Venezuela. There's a lot of concern amongst the American people about that. Uh, that is also intensified interest in energy policy. John, what's your, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that said, I think that is correct, that uh, economic factors continue to drive the debate. But I think th that we have seen a shift as uh, both uh, politicians and the public more generally is interested in the environmental problem that's associated with the conventional energy system. We are seeing increasing evidence of the kind of problems we're suffering both at the poles where uh, rapid uh, temperature increases are taking place uh, to events that we can't easily explain uh, by the underlying science that we know now on climate. Uh, all of this, I think, is giving people pause. It, economic factors will continue to uh, be the, the key driver, but I think that in increasingly climate is very important in shaping the debate. And of course, the debates that we're having uh, policy-wise around the world, uh, Copenhagen as an example, we are really trying to understand better now how we can cooperate in a, pro in a proposal that would reduce carbon and at the same time uh, also reduce cost. Great Decisions spoke with a number of other experts on uh, consumer behavior and really civic responsibility in relation to understanding U.S. energy policy. Why don't we listen to what they had to say? 
The public, of course, has two major roles in energy policy. One is the participation as citizens in elections. And I think you see a growing number of elected officials concerned about the environment, concerned about related energy issues. And obviously, they voted for a president who's made this a top agenda item. But the public has also got a second role as consumers. And I think you see them increasingly exercising their consumer sovereignty to drive for greener products uh, across the spectrum, from household cleaning issues uh, to a real push for greater energy efficiency in the goods and services they provide. I think we suffer in this country from disinformation, misinformation, and lack of information. I'd like to fill that vacuum, fill it with good information, because public policy is really the core opportunity we have to solve our energy future. Without sound public policy, if we just move from right to left or from zig, one zig to another zag, if we simply let special interests determine the future of the country, we're all going to lose. I know that uh, U.S. government is also seriously uh, considering what kind of measure they should be taken. The House uh, Energy and Climate uh, Subcommittee uh, has already taken uh, action on their domestic legislation. This will be a huge political impact. There's been a shift in two respects. There's been a shift in terms of the kind of legislation that's being proposed and the kind of regulations that are being proposed, uh, and also in terms of spending. Now, some of that clearly has to do with the change in administrations and the philosophy of the, of the administration. Some of it has to do with the recession and the stimulus, which is a response to the recession. So uh, they mentioned the civic responsibility component. Uh, John, do you agree that that's essential? And are we, as a country, uh, meeting our obligations when it comes to informing Americans about energy policy? It is certainly essential. We are not going to solve this problem if we don't have everyone involved. The carbon problem on the climate side is just too ubiquitous for us to solve it by uh, a small number of policies aimed at a few industries. We're going to have to do this having everybody involved. Are we meeting our obligations? Frankly, I don't think we are at this stage, but we do have a new administration, and we are beginning to change the policy landscape uh, in the directions that the uh, Secretary uh, mentioned, and that's really very, very important that we begin doing that. Obviously, the Bush administration was uh, criticized for some of its environmental and energy policies, and a lot of people were looking for a, a shift in the new administration. Uh, but let's talk about the policies themselves. Has, have things changed uh, with this new administration, Michael? I think they've changed enormously, but let's take a quick step back first. You also asked, are people being informed properly? And we still don't have a particularly informed conversation about energy or about the environment in this country. There's an enormous amount of misinformation, a lack of understanding, and there's going to need to be a much clearer effort to communicate to the public on that front. On the policy agenda, absolutely, this administration has moved forward on on fuel efficiency standards, mileage standards for cars in a strong way. It's moved forward on environmental protection agency regulations for emissions. It's moved forward through its stimulus package on funding transformative technology, research development and demonstration projects, and it's worked hard on broader energy package for Congress. What are some of the factors that have allowed this administration to take some of these steps? I think there are a couple of things. As uh, was mentioned also, the, there has been a political shift in this country. Our uh, public now demands that we take a more leadership role than we have in the past. And uh, so part of it is, I think, a, a civic, uh, uh, civil society-based uh, approach. But I think also what's happening is that, frankly, the costs of renewable energy uh, technologies are declining. The uh, opportunities for energy efficiency have always been uh, low-hanging fruit, very low cost. And on that economic driver, when we're in a difficult economy and things are being decided uh, through that prism, uh, frankly speaking, the sustainable energy options are our better opportunity. You referred to the financial crisis there. Uh, is that something that's allowed the Obama administration to uh, perhaps uh, push through some of these changes on the environmental and economic front, Michael? I think it's been a mixed bag. On the one hand, drawing up of capital has been a big problem in renewable energy. Renewable energy has very low fuel costs, obviously, uh, essentially zero, but it has high upfront costs. So uh, seizing up of the capital markets has had a big negative impact on the renewable energy business. At the same time, uh, the crisis created a situation where the administration could, could move forward in, on a lot of initiatives, including uh, helping out on that front uh, in order to spur investment in renewable energy. More broadly, though, it's made a lot of people out there jittery about their economic situation, which has made it trickier to move forward some of the tougher pieces of legislation and regulation that we need to put in place if we are going to improve our energy security and deal with our climate change problems.
What about uh, implementing policies that actually, and incentives rather, that, that really encourage Americans to take steps to uh, consume energy and to use energy more efficiently? Every estimate we have is that energy efficiency is our lowest cost and uh, largest uh, opportunity for cutting carbon. It's, uh, it's the way to go, and the U United States has fallen behind in many cases on these policies, but currently we are beginning to now uh, resume that leadership role. And one example is we need a 21st century utility for a 21st, en for, for a 21st century energy uh, sector. We need a utility that really makes its business model is to make money by helping people to use far less energy and when they need energy to uh, utilize renewable energy. And that is the gist of the sustainable energy utility that we've created in the state of Delaware. Washington, D.C. has now by law created one. The city of Philadelphia has created one. And there are several other jurisdictions around the country that are looking at this model. Great Decisions also spoke with a number of experts on uh, investment in alternative energies. And why don't we have a listen to what they had to say? If we look at all the energy that's used today in this country, from transportation fuels to electricity, 93% of our energy comes from hydrocarbons, meaning coal, gas, or oil, or nuclear. About 5% of our energy comes from hydropower. About 2% of our energy comes from renewable sources. That is a dramatic fact that very few people understand. When we talk about growing a green economy, we're starting from a very small base. We're starting from a 2 or 5 or 7 percent base if you count hydropower as renewable. So we're starting from a very low base. We have to be concerned about what level of investment we continue to put into the 93 percent because what we don't want to do is in the course of moving towards a renewable future, we don't want to run out of electricity. We don't want to run out of liquid fuels for our vehicles. We don't have mass transit in this country to make up for not having a vehicle. And we don't have battery-powered cars, not anytime soon. My worry is that because of there's so much focus on the 2%, that we're not putting enough focus on the 93%. And we can't just turn off the 93% and continue to have the world's largest economy or to continue have a, to have the lifestyles that we're accustomed to. You've seen investment ramping up uh, until the collapse in the economy in 2008, and there was a steep decline as almost no investment was going anywhere. But it's bounced back quite strongly uh, in uh, 2009, and I think you're going to see 2010 be even bigger in terms of investment in a whole sweep of energy future options, wind power, solar power, uh, second generation biofuels, some more exotic things like a wave power and tidal power. And then I think you're even getting people starting to invest quite heavily in extracting fuel from algae and a variety of uh, possibilities like that. In terms of alternative energy, it's really the best of times and the worst of times. It's the best of times long term in the sense that for all sorts of political and consumer sentiment and environmental reasons, I think there's a broad sense that these technologies uh, have a pretty rosy trajectory um, over some long term, whatever that long term is. The difficulty is that they have a hump to uh, get past, which is which is the economy these days. And so the question for a lot of these companies is whether they can survive the recession. So John Hoffmeister points out that 2% of our energy is coming from alternative sources. Uh, yet the Obama administration would like to see 25% uh, of US electricity coming from alternative sources uh, by 2025. Uh, is there a, a mismatch here? Is this, is this something that's even possible, Michael? Getting 25% of our electricity from renewable sources by 2025 is a stretch. I think that we can expand our use of renewable energy substantially. Uh, we can shift in our vehicles from liquid fuels to electricity, particularly in our cars and our light trucks, not entirely by then, but to a substantial degree. And we can really get the momentum heading in the right direction. At the same time, we need to be looking at other alternative sources of energy. The alternatives aren't just renewable sources. There's nuclear power, which has an uncertain future. There's uh, the potential of burning coal and storing, sequestering the emissions so that we can do that in a cleaner way. So there are a variety of different things that we need to be looking at, renewables being a significant piece, uh, but far from the whole thing. John, uh, what about renewables? Are we focusing too much on, on that small sector? No, no, I don't think so. But I think the, uh, the question of how much we're going to get in part depends upon what we do on the demand side. 
If we tighten up our buildings and our vehicles and make them perform better so that we, for example, most estimates show that we've got about a 40% uh, efficiency opportunity in this country that we could produce in that same time period by 2025. If we reduce demand by 20%, uh, uh, 20, uh, 40% by uh, 2025, we can certainly hit 25% of our electricity to come from renewables. It's a problem that we have to solve both on the demand side and the supply side together. And is there a risk that by focusing so much on this 2%, we're actually neglecting the 98% of, of the sources that we're actually getting our energy from, whether it be uh, oil or other natural resources? Is, is there a risk in focusing too much on, on alternatives? There's a risk, but it's not an inevitable risk by any stretch. I think if policymakers become obsessed with one part and don't pay attention to maintaining stable, reliable, reasonably priced sources of the energy that we rely on right now, then yes, we have a problem. But there's nothing out there that says that you can't do one and the other at the same time. And we should be doing both. And as John says, looking at the efficiency side too, so that we don't need to have as much energy in the first place to do all the same stuff that we want to do. Uh, and just because you know something is uh, green or trendy and looking at some of these alternative energies doesn't necessarily mean that it's better. Uh, and I'm thinking of the case of uh, corn-based ethanol. Uh, which I think most people would consider to be something of a disaster in this country. Uh, would you care to comment on that? Yeah, we made a mistake. It's, it, the policy uh, incentivized the wrong things. We're going to have to undo that. It's never easy when you make a policy mistake to undo it because stakeholders come in on behalf of that policy. But it is something that uh, we have to be careful about. I don't think the government's uh, role should be in this case to pick winners, technology winners or business winners. The government's role inst instead should be to set that, uh, that set of policy goals and uh, in that process give us the signals uh, as a society of uh, what we should really be expecting to be able to invest in for the future. And if we do that, and it's a, it's a full portfolio, just as Michael said, so that we include all of the opportunities, I think that we can, we can reach the goals that uh, our president has set for us, both in the near term and in the long term. And Michael, are there any other lessons learned from the corn-based uh, ethanol uh, example? Well, a big lesson, of course, uh, as you just heard, is that you don't want to pick one thing and put all of your bets on it. The second is sometimes you're going to have to live with your mistakes, and we're going to live with that mistake, fine. Uh, no policy is perfect. At the same time, we shouldn't kid ourselves into thinking that we can have perfectly technology-neutral policies where we somehow provide incentives that uh, provide no particular advantage to one or another source. We're going to have to acknowledge that the policy tools we pick will help some parts more than others, recognize that and make good choices. So moving into the 2010 landscape for alternative energies, uh, where are some, um, some points of light that you see uh, uh, having some promise in, uh, for future uh, energy needs? I would certainly say in, in the case of solar energy, we've gone in just a, a short uh, period of time from a 15% efficient cell to a 21% efficient cell. Uh, both the University of Delaware and the National Renewable Energy Laboratory have demonstrated experimentally a 42% efficient cell. That's a game changer. We are also likely to see in the bioenergy area that we are going to find ways to get a sugar-based uh, uh, fuel, and out of that we're going to be able to combine electricity and a, a low no-carbon uh, uh, option on the liquid fuel side that will give us uh, solutions in the, in the transportation sector. So I'd have my eye out on those two. Uh, wind will continue to play a very important role, and my hope is that we will do a much better job on the energy efficiency side than we have to, to date. Well, U.S. energy policy obviously intersects with U.S. foreign policy on a number, a number of levels. Uh, we spoke with some of our other experts on this issue. Let's uh, have a listen. Informed, intelligent leaders in places like Saudi Arabia, in places like uh, uh, Brazil, they're aware of the decarbonizing efforts underway, whether it's the U.S. or Europe or other places. They're not very worried. They're not very worried because they know that for the next 10, 20, 30, or even 40 years, while these decarbonizing efforts are underway, their crude oil will continue to be in demand. They also know that the easy oil has been found and produced. So what they have available to sell will be needed by global markets, including the United States, for decades to come. They're not particularly worried, but the intelligent ones are already planning for the post-oil future. And I think as long as energy supply lines run through the Middle East, there's a, a very difficult time getting out from under that as a fundamental strategy uh, element of the United States foreign policy and perhaps a burden. Uh, and frankly, if you're still committed to fossil fuels, even if you were to get out of the Middle East, 
you're going to be stuck dealing with countries like Russia and Kazakhstan and Nigeria and Venezuela, almost a laundry list of countries you don't want your lifeblood of the economy running through. So even if uh, alternative energies only make up, say, 2 percent of our, our overall energy needs, uh, this movement in the direction of alternative energies, what impact will it have on our relationship with uh, countries uh, such as Saudi Arabia and other oil-producing countries around the world? Well, let me just first, I just want to quickly mention that energy transformations occur. They have. We, we went from a wood-based economy to a coal-based economy to an oil-based economy to a natural gas. And every time that that happened, when we went from wood to coal, coal looked small. When we went from coal to oil, oil looked small. When we went from oil to... So I, I think we shouldn't get too hung up on the 2 percent notion that, uh, that uh, was mentioned by one of the experts. But that said, yeah, I think the, the big issue, and, and, and I think Michael, of course, is the better one on, on uh, much of this, but the big issue that we're going to have to look forward to is how are we going to have relations with the wider part of the world where we are going to get our energy for a period of time? How are we going to do that intelligently while we make this transition to a low, no-carbon future? And for that purposes, we, we have a lot of uh, foreign policy work ahead of us to make that, uh, make that happen. Michael, what are some of those challenges? Well, there's a big challenge here because on the one hand, if we ultimately do move away from traditional fuels, that essentially drives their price to zero. Uh, when you can't sell something for money, you don't invest in it. On the other hand, we need countries and companies to invest in oil and in gas to get us through the next however many decades that they are going to be with us. So we need a stable price environment, a fairly decent price environment for that kind of investment at the same time that we're trying to tell people that that price is going to uh, decline. We haven't really sorted out how we, how we do that. Um, we're going to have to in order to maintain stable supplies. I should say the challenge of that goes beyond just balancing a move away from fossil fuels and, uh, and a need for investment in these areas. As we move to this harder to get uh, oil in particular, a lot of it's much more capital intensive, requires a lot more investment up front. That requires much more certainty about the ability to get a return on that investment over a period perhaps of decades, and we haven't really solved how to make the markets work in a reliable way. And that's why a lot of people worry that while the price of oil might not go through the roof, it may be extremely volatile for a long time. And what about the oil producing con uh, countries themselves? How are they reacting to the situation and how are they planning for the long term? Look, when they come into international negotiations, they certainly aren't enthusiastic about global efforts to cut the use of fossil fuels and of oil in particular. Uh, but they're playing along, and some of them are actually investing in alternative sources. Uh, there are different theories for why they do that. I think part of it is as a hedge. Part of it is to get the best intelligence and insight possible into the alternatives that might be coming along. But uh, some of these countries are looking at a variety of different options. And they also understand that even if the developed world moves away, for example, from oil in the next several decades, the developing world will take longer. There will be a lot of uh, demand for fossil fuels for a long time. You mentioned the, the developing world, and there is increased competition for these resources. China and India are both very energy hungry. Uh, sh how should we be looking to interact with those countries uh, in, in the pursuit of, of oil and energy around the world? Well, China and India, in order for our economy to work, China's and India's economy need to work in the 21st century. It's simply we, we live in an inter interdependent world, and we can't have a good economy if China and India aren't also. And in that respect, we do need to understand that China and India, just as Michael said, are going to need for a period of time fuels that they can afford as the bridge is built to a new low-carbon, uh, no-carbon future. And so during that period, we need to work carefully with China and India on the technology side. There needs to be much better technology transfer than we have now. We need to make available that set of options so that when these, uh, these uh, uh, new opportunities come into play, that uh, China's working from the newest technology rather than simply working through an older range of technologies uh, into the future. And I think uh, we have the opportunity to do that. I think we have really a very strong need economically to do that as well. And uh, if we succeed, we will have much better relations with China and India as we head toward this uh, low carbon uh, goal. And one arena that we might be able to dis discuss some of these issues with China and India are in climate change talks and uh, moving forward uh, beyond uh, Kyoto. Uh, what's the landscape going to look like in terms of climate change in 2010, Michael? We need to look broadly. It's not just in climate discussions, but in economic discussions. So, for example, in September 2009 at the G20 meeting, uh, all the countries there agreed to look at rationalizing and phasing out their subsidies for fossil fuel consumption. That's an extraordinary reason why the consumption is so high, not just in China and India, but in the Middle East as well. So those are the kinds of global steps uh, we can take forward. Uh, looking at the climate change scene in 2010, the big question 
continues to be what will countries actually do on the ground. We can have a lot of discussion, whether positive or negative, about global goals, overarching global principles, very important, but what ultimately matters is the implementation. What incentives do countries put on the ground for companies to invest, for consumers to make the right decisions that take us in a positive direction? Michael Levy, Senior Fellow for Energy and the Environment at the Council on Foreign Relations, and John Byrne, Distinguished Professor of Energy and Climate Policy at the University of Delaware. Thank you both for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for watching. I'm Robert Nolan. To learn more about topics discussed on Great Decisions, visit our website at greatdecisions.org. Great Decisions is available on DVD. To order, visit shoppbs.org or call 1-800-PLAY-PBS. Funding for Great Decisions in Foreign Policy is provided by the Carnegie Corporation of New York, the Star Foundation, Shell International, and the European Commission. Great Decisions is produced in association with the University of Delaware.